I've had, I've had many thoughts about Scripture over the years, and uh, like anybody else who's been studying the Bible for a period of time, and mine's been a rather long period, but a, a period of time, you, you end up with uh, different perspectives, and uh, perhaps your theological position might change. Uh, my core beliefs have not changed. Salvation by grace through faith. Uh, upon the merit of Jesus in his living and then giving his life a sacrifice and the guarantee of eternal life, his raising from the dead. Those Amen. things don't change. That's right. um, baptism as a, uh, well, it's, a pref it's an outward profession of an inward thing, but it's also coming out of the world into the Lord's body, the church. And uh, so those things haven't changed and, and there's a lot of other stuff that hasn't changed. Some things, though, in a way of understanding, have changed. Like, for instance, I used to, I used to really get bothered by the, um, the text in Hebrews where it said where, when um, Esau sought repentance but couldn't find it. I thought, I thought, how is it that God wouldn't let him repent? But that's not what that verse is talking about. The verse is talking about Esau wanting his dad to change his mind about him not having an offer, a, a, a blessing to give him. And he sought that repentance of his father. He sought his father's changing of his mind, even weeping and crying, Dad, please, you got to have an offering for me. you got to have a blessing for me. And even though he, he wept and he was sorrowful, there was no, uh, there was no blessing for him. It was, it was already gone. So, so I thought, wow, that was... Then I, when I understood, I go, whew. <laughs> Right, that put me on a whole different playing field because up till then I thought, my goodness, are there sins that God won't let me repent of? You know, that's an awful feeling when you think that you've done something and God won't say, won't, you know, sorry, dude, you're on your own now. I'm not going to forgive you for that. But then, you know, there are scriptures that clarify that. Like, for instance, David saying, a broken and a contrite heart thou will not refuse. And Jesus saying, anyone that comes to the Father brings to me, I will not refuse. And so those are comforting passages of scripture. And in like, in, in like thought, I, Luke 21, verse uh, 26, has, has these words. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Well, I used to think that that meant that as the closer we got to the end times, heart, heart, heart attack rates would increase. <laughs> That's honestly what I thought. I thought that, you know, people would be dying of heart attacks. Because, they, because of, of fear and, and, and because he says, uh, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Well, there are things that are going to be coming that are going to happen that are going to be. Listen, if, if the reality of what the Muslim world is doing to the world today doesn't cause you some consternation, right. you're asleep. Amen. That's right. Because there's, there's, no, there's no getting along. No. There's no desire to be compatible. There's no let's fellowship here. Let's get together. We want to be inclusive. We're not a, a religion of hate. And we're a religion of peace. D don't buy that. Right. That's right. I, listen, I'm, I'm 63 years old, okay? And I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I know I look a lot younger and act a lot <laughs> younger. You know? I still ride motorcycles. You know, I'm, I still like speed. You know? The two-wheeled speed, okay? Uh, yeah, just, I didn't have my strange thoughts for other reasons. I was just immature and didn't understand, okay? But, uh, but um, I, I've watched that thing unfold in the world since I was a teen. I've, I'm, I'm a weird kid, uh, the weirdest one in my family, and they'll, they'll tell you that's true. Uh, when I was 13 years old, my mother would say, okay, what time are you going to bed? Everybody else would be, and I'd be still up. I'd say, well, after the news. <laughs> After the news, I'll go to bed, 11, 11, yeah. 11.30. I'd be up at 13 years old, I'm watching the news. Yeah. You know, at 13 years old, I should have been doing something else, but I, I'm watching the news. I'm watching world events. I know what's going on, that kind of thing. And, and, and after I was saved and, and joined Lord's Church, and people said, hey, you want to take a trip to Jerusalem, Israel? No. Why not? Because I'm going to see it from above coming down. Yeah, was, you know, no problem. I had those things resolved in my heart. And so, so you know, but, but then there were scriptures like this that I just intellectually didn't quite understand because I didn't understand enough of scripture to put them in context. But I've watched, I've watched that, you know, the, the, the thing getting coming out of the box. 
take the, the genie out of the bottle and try to put it back in. That's kind of a hard thing to do. And, uh, and, and there's an inscription. One of, the, one of the things that's inspiring and yet also at the same time a little heartbreaking is go to Washington, D.C. and read the inscriptions on the buildings. And you're wondering, why aren't we living according to those inscriptions? Because we're not. Those inscriptions were noble thoughts and, and a heartfelt, inspirational things that governed the institution of this country. They were, they were how the framers of the country saw the way life ought to be lived. And they were godly men. And I don't care, don't let anybody else tell you different. They were godly men. They were men who were believers. Now, how they understood God may be different from one to the other, and I don't mean to denigrate anything, it's, but they were believers. And, and you can't read the Declaration of the Pen Independence without saying Jesus all over that document because it's there. That's right. All right. So this whole idea of being inclusive, this, the, the whole idea, coexist, coexist. You know, it, well, the, the, I've, I've, listen, when I was 18 years old, I, I was introduced to the proper New Testament church. Amen. And I, I, I got, I was baptized, and I was in the Lord's proper church. Amen. Okay? And I never ever since that day have ever decided I needed to find a scriptural church other than when I was moving from one location to the other. Right. I've always known what the New Testament church is, and I'm, and I'm blessed to be a part. And one of the great anxieties of my life is that if I ever got cut off, I would not want to be outside the assembly of the Lord's church. Amen. I, just wouldn't, I just wouldn't want to be. That's, that's, that's a place of, of great angst. And I think that's what Paul was talk I mean, uh, David was talking about when he said in, in his repentance, Psalm 51, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He, it, it wasn't that he was afraid he was going to get lost, be unborn. This, uh, salvation, listen, I will always refer to salvation as a new birth. Jesus referred to it that way. And there's a reason for it to be referenced that way. Amen. You can't be unborn. That's right, that's right. Now, you may mess up your life. And have a life that, uh, having lived it, somebody said, well, that was a wasted life. <laughs> but wasted is not unborn. Once you're born again, you cannot become unborn, regardless of what things you do. And, and the things you do may be horrific and a, and a great detriment and a shame to the work in general, but you can't be unborn. Now, there's consequences to living like that. And the consequences I would not want to face. And David understood that even from the concept of being cut off. That's right. So, the whole, the whole idea of, of this relationship with God is one that I've treasured, that I appreciate, and that I wouldn't want to be separated from. The days are coming, have been, where that reality gets challenged every single day. It does get challenged every single day. Yeah. And this idea that America is not a Christian nation, when it gets espoused by the man at the top, America is not a Christian nation, not true. He may not be, but the, the nation is. And, and the nation is quiet. But let me tell you what happens with all of this, these, these difficult times that we're in. It causes great consternation and anxiety in the lives of people and in the minds of people. It makes us concerned about the welfare of our children. Amen. We think about public school, public education. You hear all the horrible things that are coming out of public education, where boys are no longer boys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. That's right. Yeah. That's where, right. Where, where all of a sudden grown adults can't say, well, you know, you, oh, you're having a baby. Yeah, what's it going to be? We don't know. Well, there used to be a time where you didn't know until it was born. Yeah. Right. But now when it's born, they're looking and going, well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, no, 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 no. You just to look at that baby. You know, we're looking at the baby and, all, you know, say, well, what is it? Well, we had a boy. I never had a problem with that. Amen. When Amy was born, we knew Amy was going to be the last one because physio uh, health wise, we knew we had to make a decision about having more children. So we knew that Amy was going to be the last child we were going to have. And, and, and it was like this. It was Frank, Selena, John, Paul, Daniel, last one. 
uh, we're only going to have one girl. <laughs> Trajectory means, that, you know, we're looking at having another boy. So when that little skinny little black stick came out and I looked at her, I said, Yolanda, it's a little girl. And I started to cry. A little girl. The last one, another girl. God's blessed us with another girl, not another ugly boy. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I th I, but I tell my boys they're handsome. Yeah. <laughs> but how did I know she was a little girl? I, wasn't, I, I hadn't lost my mentality. I, God gave me evidence. It was a girl. <laughs> this, but today you got adults who cannot understand. They're, they willingly tell you their lack of mental prowess when they say, well, we don't know what we have. How old is it? Well, it's 10 years old, but it thinks it's a girl. Well, quit dressing him like a girl. He'll be all right. But, uh, but I tell you, that kind of stuff, you send your kid away to school, and you think they're going to learn how to read and write math, they come back at home, and they tell you, you, uh, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> well, let's fix that one real quick, <laughs> you know? But they come home with a whole different mindset about life and reality, and you know what? Three... Three services isn't enough to overcome that. That's right, that's right. Even if you're extremely faithful to being the church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday evenings, three times that your children get spiritual education isn't over, enough to overcome all the anti-God, anti-Jesus stuff that's right, that that's they will good. face, not only in their public education system, but in every day-to-day -day stuff they hear on the radio, television, and all that junk. That's right. I'll tell you what, Yolanda and I, we, we, were, we sat down, we had pretty much the day by ourselves yesterday, which was a blessing for the kids, because yeah. they had a day to themselves, yeah. and a blessing to us, because we just had a day of being old people that just laid around. But, uh, so we decided we were going to watch a movie last night, and we, we picked a movie that, well, we've heard a lot about this, I've heard a lot about this, and the movie was Philomena. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It was great. Until you find out that her son was dead and that she finds out that he's a homosexual and she said, oh, I've always known he was. I said, well, he was taken when he was like two years old. Yeah, but he was such a special child. And all of a sudden you start hearing about how this adult man was a homosexual in his life and that's when the movie went turned off. Oh, yes, yes, yes. When he kissed his lover in the forehead, I'm going, that's it. I can't take any more. That's done. We're done. Find something else. Let's find a war movie in Uganda. <laughs> Good. I couldn't stand that. I said, it was great up till then. It was a great love story. It was a great story. It was a great angst and passion thing and, and hopefulness and all that stuff. And then, and then when you get to the end of it, you're going like, that devil, he sure is clever. He got me. I mean, I'm almost in the boat. They're reeling me in, my heart's there, oh, this is going to be great when we find out. And then you find out, I got a carp. <laughs> what is Jesus talking about to his disciples in Luke 21? He's talking about when life, and, and it's going to happen, when it's going to get more and more difficult. Paul talks about it. The days will come, there'll be trying times, there'll be difficult times. Why will, be they, why will they be difficult? Because no matter what evidence you give to people, their own selfful, lustful desires and their craving for power cannot be abated. That's right. I, I've, I've stopped, as much as I can, stop listening to conservative radio. Not because I don't agree. I'm tired of being frustrated. I, I hear it, and so, you know what? Sometimes I turn it on because I want to hear it better than music. Because I, I want to hear truth in a political sense. Okay? But I stop hearing it because the things that I hear, I'm going like, yeah, that'll win the day. Five years ago, I stopped thinking that'll win the day. I, I, I could tell you the day that I laughed at the politicians. The day they said, well, if we win this election, we win that. I'm, in a, I'm in a van in the middle of Simi Valley driving for my company. And I'm listening to the news, and I hear this political guy say, well, we need to keep an eye on this race, and that race, and that race, and then, you know, we win these, and then we'll have the house, and, we'll have, and I'm, going, I'm laughing, and I'm going, you dope, you don't get it. That's right. You don't get it because it doesn't matter anymore. That's right. It doesn't matter anymore. 
And you see, that reality can cause you a whole lot of heartache. Yeah. And it causes you a lot of mental discombobulation, for lack of better words. You can you just get all twisted up and get all filled with anxiety and emotion. And you know what happens? Jesus said, men's hearts will fail them. I'm not talking about heart attacks. He's not talking about clogged up arteries and people going, oh, and flaking out. He's not talking about that. He's talking about men who lose their courage. That's right. And who, longer, who no longer will stand for truth Amen. and stand against great opposition. This country was established by men who stood up under tremendous opposition. Amen. They were standing against the king, knowing that to say they were against the king made them criminals. That's right. And in America today, if you own the right kind of weapon, you're a criminal. And you weren't one 24 hours ago. That's right. What does that do for average, uh, uh, not, not just the average citizen, but what does it do to the believer who has his heart and soul and realizes what truth is and is liberated in his heart and wants to share that with everybody else? Yeah. And, he's a and he's a criminal. What does, that want, what does that make you want to do? Does it make you want to hide somewhere? I'll be honest and say, well, I thought about it. Yeah. Hit the lottery. Millions of dollars. Go to Idaho and buy 1,500 acres. And then build... build listen, there's a, there's a house in Camarillo. There's a house in Camarillo that has, that has a bunker mentality. Because his wall, his walls around and his huge gates, telephone poles. And I'm thinking, that's a... There's a guy after my own heart. <laughs> He's just in the middle of Camarillo. He's got the wrong place. You know? He needs to be out in the middle of forested country somewhere. And then he can guard the road. But I'm just thinking, you know, predator, drones, tanks. There's no way you're going to hide. There's no way you're going to hide. It's going to be perilous times. So what's the point of the message? To make you afraid? No, 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 no. On the contrary. Because Jesus said... Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are come, coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now let's look at Luke 18, verse 1. The great master, the lover of his people. He, Jesus loved us more than just eternal life, beloved. And I, I, hate, I hate when I use terms like just. But Jesus loved us and included everything about our lives. He, did not, he, wasn't, he wasn't only concerned with our eternal destiny, i.e. heaven or hell. He was concerned with our daily living. Jesus said, for, for the Son of Man has come to give them life and life more abundantly. You know what that means? That means we can have a better life while we have this life. Right. It's, it's, it's not, listen, some, people, some people's perspective is all skewed. They think that all this, this relationship with Jesus is all about more world. Yeah. More stuff. Yeah. More stuff. Yeah. God wants you to have more stuff. Yeah. Jesus wants you to have more stuff. Mm -hmm. God's committed. Claim the promise and get your stuff. Mm -hmm. Command the Lord to get your stuff. You know, I, I bind you by your word. Oh, yeah, right, sure. Mm -hmm. Fine. Yeah, right. That's not going to happen, beloved. It's not more about the world because the world is going... Uh, what, what would pastor say? Hell in a handbasket. Yeah, right? Yeah. But I don't talk like that. But anyway. <laughs> All right. So, so what, what is it? What, what, what is this about? Well, in 18.1, Jesus cared and he, he spoke to them and he said, He spoke a parable unto them to this end. This was his objective. That men ought always to pray and not faint. What will be happening when time gets more difficult? Men will faint. That's, that's that word, uh, they, they, failing them for fear. That word failing is faint. It means to give out. It means, it means to not have the energizer bunny reality. It means that you're going to go, going, I can't do this anymore. And you're done. That, that you can't, that, that church no longer, you, you find it's, well, there's nothing there. Well, there's always something here. In the very relationship, there's something there. And the grabbing that relationship, understanding that relationship beyond, beyond attendance. Amen. 
Because this relationship exists, goes on, and impactful in my life when I'm here and when I'm not here. That's right. Because this relationship is what I am. Amen. It's not what I do. Amen. It's not what I do. It's what I am. And I am that by the privilege of God's Son, who not only saved my soul, but called me by His Spirit to come join Him in this work. Amen. Whether I presented that too very well or not in the last message, about, you know, there's no magic words, no abracadabra, but Jesus, they said, that, you know, uh, physician, heal yourself. Yeah. And then they tried to throw Him off a cliff and kill Him, because He wouldn't do for them what He'd been doing everywhere else. And the point that I was trying to make in that message was there's more than just the bread and the loaves and those things. There's more to that. Jesus is offering a full relationship. Amen. An everyday, ongoing relationship of hope that carries you through the difficult times, the hard times. He taught them a parable. Why? So that they wouldn't faint. So that they wouldn't become weary. They needed to understand Sometimes it's difficult, beloved, but praying is not just a one-time event. Because in, in Luke 18, he's talking about continuing to pray. Always praying. That means being ready to pray. Let me tell you something. We live in a world of anxieties. I can, I can raise my hand and say, yeah, I know what that's about. And my kids can laugh about it because their dad gets freaked out about all kinds of things. <laughs> Given the right day, dad will get freaked out of his own shadow. What the heck was that? <laughs> you know? But you know, I've learned something. I've learned what causes me to freak out. Because I wasn't this way when I was younger. I've learned what's, what's happened. When you allow yourself to get distracted. And you allow yourself to not be focused on the Lord's work like you ought to be. You can get freaked out. And when you start working in, in your life and allowing things to happen in your life that are contrary to the will of God, and you know they're contrary to the will of God, and you allow sin to secretly creep into your heart, you know what happens? You'll get freaked out. Yeah. You'll start worrying about things that didn't worry you when you were younger, when you were vibrant, when you were energized, when you were connected to the Lord in a way that you understood and it, it, it thrilled your heart to do it, but you, you get lazy. You know, we live in a world filled with anxieties. And what is the world? How does the world want to answer that? Well, some people get full of anxieties when they're young and they, they become addicts. Yeah. They become all kinds of addicts. Drug addicts, alcohol addicts, work addicts, sex addicts. Yeah. They have all kinds of things that they try to do to relieve the anxiety. Right. And you know what the main anxiety is? They're going to die. Yeah. I'm serious. That's the main anxiety. I don't care if you're 15 years old or 55 years old or 75 years old. The anxiety of dying happens. But you know what abates that anxiety? It's not pills. It's not psychotherapy. I mean, sometimes those things are necessary. I, I get that and I get it in a, with about that much reality that I get it. But you know, Jesus said those days are going to be difficult days and men's hearts will fail them for fear. They'll flake out. Yes. They'll give up. They'll quit. Yep. They'll become discouraged. They'll lose their way. Yep. They'll be broken. That's a word that's a powerful word. When you're broken. Yeah. When you no longer take the lead. Yeah. Because you're crushed about taking the lead. Mm -hmm. When you no longer stand as a leader in your family. Because you no longer have the courage to stand and lead your family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you're no longer bold enough, strong enough... Convicted to the point to where you will stand even against your family. Oh, my kids remember stuff like this. I don't care. I don't care who's wearing it. And I don't care if you're buying it because you ain't buying it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Was that true? I'm not making it up. They know. You're not wearing it. Oh, Selena still loves to show me magazine stuff with, you know, piercing the nose and purple and whatever and all that stuff. And she said, Dad, I'm going to get my hair cut like that. Yeah, well, at 63, and she's 32, I think, or she's 32? Yeah, she's an old girl. Anyway, she'll, she'll show me stuff like that, not just now we laugh about it. But when she was a teen, she would show me stuff like that all the time, just to, just to get a reaction. No, you're not going to get that haircut like that. What's wrong with that one? What are you talking to your child? Go talk to your daughter. She doesn't get a haircut like that. <laughs> yeah, but Dad, but I've earned the money. I'm going to buy that. No, you're not. <laughs> I can shave your head. <laughs> Save your money. No. 
But they know. But will there come a time? Will you be crushed and not be able to do that anymore? You know, my kids, you, you know why they don't like to watch movies with me? Because I tell them all the political crud that's in there. <laughs> you know, they just said, Dad, we know. At this point, you know, Amy's the youngest now, but she's old enough. She says, Dad, we know. We get it. You know, Dad, don't tell us. We know what this movie's about. <laughs> and if there's a movie where you get the surprise with a scene that you shouldn't see, Amy's the one that's going, <laughs> speeding it up, man. No, don't look, don't look, don't look. You know? It's great when your kids become the parents who tell you, Dad, you shouldn't see that. <laughs> you know what that means to me? I've done a good job. <laughs> At least they know that I shouldn't see it, so they should you know, they skip it over there, not seeing it either. But somebody saw it in the first place, but how do they know you shouldn't see it? That's what I just said. <laughs> All right, so let's quickly now move through the rest of the message. Luke eleven. He taught them a parable so that men ought to pray and not faint. Where is the strength, beloved? The strength is a communication process with God yes. that comforts the heart, that brings peace to the mind, that strengthens the soul, that gives you vibrancy, conviction, commitment, and a clear path of how you should live your life. And the strength. You know, where did Paul get this idea where he says, I can do all things. I know what the Pentecostals, I know what the Church of God people think. I know what all those folks think about. I can do all, through, all things through Jesus Christ who strengthened me. You know, therefore give me your money. You know, it's like the abracadabra. I can do all things through Jesus Christ. What does he mean by that, all things? I can do all things. You know what Paul's talking about? I can go to that town where they told me they're going to kill me. You know why? Because the Lord has comforted my heart. Amen. He's put, brought peace to my mind. I know that I'm going there and, and, and I know nothing but that they're going to kill me. But I don't even count my life dear to me. Amen. Where does that come from? That's the Lord. That's, that's the work that God... See, there's, a thing that, there's things that Jesus, that God can only do. They're out of our control. They're not within our ability to resolve. All that we can do is just follow His leadership and then trust His ability. And that ability is what comforts the heart. It was, it, it's what makes one look courageous when one is not really courageous. You know what Paul said to the Corinthians? When I was with you, I was with you in fear and trembling. The Apostle Paul come to you, I'm here with fear and trembling. That was not just fancy talk. He was there like, I, I can imagine he was there looking when somebody started to move going like, is that the guy? You know, is that the guy? You know, they, they stoned him. They lowered him out of a town in the basket because they're, they're coming to kill him. You know, so when he gets to Corinth, as I was with you with fear and trembling. Why? Because he's a human being. But why was he there in fear and trembling? Because he was trusting God that he was going to do what was necessary to do because people needed to hear the gospel message. Amen. And why do we need to stand? So that at the end of the day we can say, well, look, I was really brave and crazy. No, we need to stand because the truth cannot, must not be obliterated. Amen. The truth of Jesus is, well, you know, Paul said something to me, the other, not the apostle, <laughs> my son. We're talking, he's driving down the road, I'm driving behind my desk. And he says to me, he says, you know, you know the world we live in today, Dad? They're crying out for Barabbas. Oh, yeah. Yes. They want Barabbas. That's right. They don't want Jesus anymore. They want Barabbas. Amen. Boy, that's a sobering reality of the world we live in today. Absolutely. And beloved, it can make your heart melt. Yes. It can cause your mind to just get to whole, you know. And when your, own, when your own loved ones, and I'm not saying this because mine support me. But if your own loved ones don't, that can be very difficult to work against. There's going to be a day. There's, amen. There's going to be a day. If, if it's not already happening, and I'm, and I'm in places there is, where the unbelieving, and maybe perhaps the marginally believing, will turn in the believing. 
and the, those of your own, Jesus said, those of your own household will become your enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Can you stand against that? Well, Paul says, uh, Jesus teaching, Luke 11, and, he is, and, and 11, 1, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. You know what? I'm convinced of this reality. I am absolutely convinced of this reality. We need to know how to pray. Amen. I know the Lord's church and we ask and people can pray and some people are, are intimidated by the public aspect of praying and don't. And sometimes I, as pastor, people come up to me and say, okay, I know I joined the church later. Please don't ever call me to pray. And I get that. I get that. That's very, you know, public speaking, even if you got, everybody's got their heads bowed and your eyes closed, public speaking and they know it's you, yeah. it's still scary, mm -hmm. you know? But do we really know how to pray so when, so when we're filled with anxiety and angst that the Lord can come and resolve those things for us and calm us down and, and allow us to maintain a perspective on things and not be broken in heart, not be caused to faint, not caused to have your heart failed to where you just, you know what, There's, I came up with this terminology a long, long time ago about drop-in, drop-outs. And perhaps this is the situation with the church. The pastor's gone to, to Wellington. He's, he's over here in, in Newhall. You know, we're getting the message of the churches who are dying. There's drop-in, drop-outs. That's right. You know what drop-in, drop-outs are? People who drop into the building out of habit but dropped out of God's plan a long time ago. That's right. You know why they dropped out? Because their hearts became weary. That's yeah. right. Their hearts were broken. Maybe, somebody, maybe something as simple as somebody being rude to them at church broke their weak heart. You know, they needed to learn how to pray and overcome. They needed to learn how to communicate with God so that he could resolve those issues and bring peace to the mind, strength to the heart, and purpose to the soul. Teach us to pray. I find that fascinating that a disciple, a person who walked with Jesus, watched him do the miracles that he did, watched him feed the thousands, walk with him, heard him talk, that they would say that they would need and cry out and say, Lord, teach us to pray. Don't you find that remarkable? I do. Because you think, I think most people's perspective of the disciples is they were just great guys. Powerful men. Great men of faith. But there were many who refused to walk with Jesus after he talked about things getting a little tough. Many no longer walked with him, the scripture says. That's right. And then he looked at his disciples and, and he looked at Peter and them and he said, well, you two walk away. And Peter said, where will we go? Amen. Well, there's a guy who had a strong heart. There's a guy that understood and had a relationship and a connection with the Lord. That is what that I like to have. That no matter what, you'll stand. That you'll stand. Teach us to pray. Well, I, I won't go all over the Lord's Prayer and the model prayer and all that stuff. And people just, you know, they, they think they're praying when they're just reciting an outline. <laughs> it's what they're doing. They're reciting an outline. So how do you pray? Well, it's real simple. You got to be honest. There is a need to pray. There's an absolute need to pray. Remember, Jesus gave this example. Uh, you, you got a friend, you got people come to visit you and you need food. And so you go to your best friend and you say, look, I got some people up from out of town. We need some food. And he says, well, uh, yeah, and we're in bed. But you got to keep going. You got to keep asking. And then not because he's your friend, but because he's tired and wants to go to sleep and wants to get you off of his back. He'll give you bread. The whole idea there is that there's a need to pray. Amen. There is a need. Do you recognize it? Do you recognize the need? That when you're feeling overwhelmed in life, there's a need to pray. Do you recognize the need? Or do you look around and say, we need more money? No, you need to pray. Amen. We need a better president. No, you need to pray. Amen. We need a better counselor. No, you need to pray. Amen. No, I need a new wife. No, you need to pray. No, I need better children. No, the need is you need to pray. Amen. We need bread. Go get it. Beg the guy. Yeah. Ask him for it. There is a need to pray. Do you recognize the need? 
Or are you looking at the need and thinking you need something totally different? When what you need to do is pray. And keep praying. And do not stop. And be honest. How many loaves do you need? Uh, half a bread, two loaves. A um, couple of slices. No, he said, we need three loaves. We need three loaves. I'd be specific. And be honest. And what time did he go ask his neighbor? At midnight. When should you pray? When you need to pray. Amen. Two o'clock in the morning, can't get back to sleep, worried about the day's events, worried about what's going on, worried about your children, worried about your life, worried about your job, worried about the world. Pray. You need to pray. You don't need the pill. You don't need another glass full. You don't need to call the counselor. Unless you want to call a pastor and wake him up, you'll get an earful. He might tell you, you need to pray. I need to sleep. Yeah. God first is the model prayer. God first. The Lord, hallowed be thy name. You recognize who you're talking to. Self next. Give us this day our daily bread. And third is others. Forgive, forgive me as I forgive others. Yes. That's, that's the basic outline. God first, you, and then others. Yep. And when you start praying and you forget God first, then you're in trouble. Yes. And when you start praying and it's all about you, 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 you got the problem wrong because you is to be stable so for others. You see, our life is about others. Amen. Until you're born again, the life, the word, the gospel is about you. Until you're born again, the, it's all about you. After you're born again, then it's about being baptized, joining the church. After that, it's about others. Because there are going to be others who were in what you were. And you are born again, and you are taught so that you can affect the lives of others. For God is not willing that any should perish. Amen. It's going to get tough, yeah. But it's about others. Prayer needs to be honest. And then you need to be careful what you're asking for. Right. What are you asking for? Yeah. Dad, uh, we need 20 bucks. What do you need 20 bucks for? Well, we're just 20 shy of a six pack. Right. Oh, oh, by all means, here's 40. Yeah. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> My, you know, if anybody ever came and asked me, you know, I'm 20 shy of a, 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 you know, of a kilo. <laughs> I'm not going to kilo you, that's for sure. Are you asking God? See, see if, if God's first, then you know what to ask for, and you know what not to ask for. Jesus said, uh, James says it very simply, very simple. Where, where do fights come from? Because you want to have stuff, and other people have it. But he's talking to the church. That's what's really remarkable, is he's having that conversation with the church. But he says, you know why you don't have? Because you don't ask. You don't recognize the need to pray. You don't have because you don't ask. But then when you ask, you don't get. You know why? Because you're asking for the 20 bucks for the six pack. That's why you're not getting it. You're asking for the wrong thing. You know what the word amiss means in James? You have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss. The word amiss can be translated diseased. Diseased. You're sick and you're asking for the wrong thing. How about that? You're sick and you're asking for the wrong thing. Make a difference in how you pray, huh? That's right. All right, let's close out. Psalmist says this If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity, that word regard means to see. But it means to see and kind of, kind of let go. Yeah, it's there. Uh, yeah, I know, I know it's there, but that's what it means. If if I hide, if I have sin in my heart, iniquity. The word iniquity isn't just natural sin because we all have that. We all have natural sin, but iniquity is deliberate sin. It's you know it was wrong, you did it anyway, and then you try to cover up for it. See, that's what David's talking about when he says, "Lord, I, you know, my iniquities are before me because I know what I." David, David knew he was wrong to murder Uriah. David knew he was wrong to have an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. Yeah. David knew his, he knew what he was doing, folks. Those weren't mistakes. That's right. Those weren't mistakes. He knew what he was doing. All right, real quick. Here's some prayers. How long will thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will thou hide thy face from me? 
There's the guy that's having problems. And what's he doing? Praying. There's more verses, but we'll read that one. <laughs> Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. What's that? There's a guy that's got trouble. Yeah. There's a guy whose life is fine, kind of filled with some anxieties and, and some issues and some complexities. What's he doing? Praying. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. My soul melteth because of heaviness. What does that sound like? A heart failing? Does a guy having a heart attack? No, no. But internally, he's full of anguish. His life has got some problems. Even if there are ex external enemies. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. Yeah, there's a need for prayer. Lord, check me out. Help me see what's there. Because sometimes we don't want to see what's there. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes that I be not ashamed. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Hmm. Those are prayers. Those are, those are individuals who have come to the realize. Most of those, David, by the way. That's an individual who's come to this reality. There is a need for me to pray. Amen. Whatever the issues are. Lord, teach us to pray. Yes. 